surprise. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and ladies. I use that joke every time. Still makes me smile. Um, welcome to She Says. Um, we've got a few people just coming in the back door, so I'm going to stall for about three minutes. This is when you wish that you had a good joke to tell. Damn it. Okay, just a quick raise of hands. Who's been to a She Says before? Ah, oh, awesome. We have some nice newbies as well, which is always a positive. So She Says is a really fun thing that we do um, every month. Um, one month it's a social session, and the next month it's a panel session. Why do we do it? Oh, sorry, Mike. <laughs> Thank you. So we are the Singapore chapter of She Says, which is a global network for women in the creative and marketing industries. We want to put more women at the top. And so uh, we have these sessions once a month to get to know more people, to learn more, and to hopefully get to the top. Okay, so tonight we've got an awesome expert panel. But just as a reminder, these are pretty casual, easygoing sessions. We love your questions as much as anybody else's. We'll get the panel to fight amongst themselves, hopefully. Um, but if you can think of all of those questions that you've ever wanted to ask, these guys are absolutely awesome. So you'll get some brilliant responses from them. Um, these, these have literally been designed and run in a way where it's pretty casual. So if I mess up, don't worry about it. You'll only have to laugh. Um, we're quite keen on networking as well. So every other month we head down um, to a bar and we get everybody to meet each other. We bring different HR groups with us, um, but it's more of a kind of welcome to Singapore, meet all the awesome people that are around you. After this, we'll do the panel and then we'll have a little bit more networking because you are only as strong as the network you've got. So this is Lizzie and I'm Alicia. She brought She Says to Singapore. Uh, three years ago, I think, and we've been running it almost every month since. And uh, she's a creative director and all around awesome person. Does Sorry. like a hundred things, I don't know, like, I can't even list out how many things. Definitely not a hundred push ups anymore. <laughs> um, Alicia's an awesome chick. Come and chat to her afterwards and learn about all of her experience. Um, there's actually a few people that help me run, she says. Um, all of these lovely people, the people that have checked you in, the people sitting in the front row with their pints of beer, um, <laughs> and even the slightly preggers one. Um, <laughs> Um, we, we couldn't do it without these guys. Um, they are all quite fascinating individuals as well, and they're really well connected. So they know a lot of people in the industry. If you're willing or interested in meeting somebody or learning something, please chat to these guys. One point, I gave them all ye yellow lanyards, so hopefully they've stopped wearing those now. Oh, whoops. <laughs> but before we start... Oh. <laughs> Sorry, Alicia. <laughs> You should wear it. You should definitely wear it. It's, wor it's working. Mine's orange, not yellow. It's so. orange. <laughs> it's a VIP one. Um, however, Farah is a massive part of She Says. She helps us organize everything, and she also gives us this space. Can you come and explain who you are and what you do for five minutes? Well, no, 30 yeah, seconds. 30 <laughs> seconds. Hi, welcome to Jesco. Jesco is uh, Singapore's largest co-working space currently. Um, as you can see, she's, we have been working very closely with She Says since last year. It's been almost a year, and they have amazed me that I volunteer for it as well. So if you, are, you need a co-working space, if you need a place to network, please don't feel, uh, feel free to come to me. Uh, we'll be giving away also, there's a table over there that we've got some notebooks from Jasco, and if you're keen, drop your name card, and then we'll give you one free day pass to work out of here for free. Thanks, enjoy the rest of the evening. Amazing. Um, Farah's very, very cool chick. Fact. <laughs> Next. <laughs> um, I hope you've all got a lovely glass of wine in your hands or a wheat beer, as they've told me. Um, Bottles XO have been joining us every event uh, for the last year or so. Um, download the app and get a free glass. Plus, you can get it wherever you are. Delicious food. Do you want to come say hi? Can everybody look at that guy, make him feel really welcome? Hi. <laughs> Okay. Um, um, these guys have got amazing food, cannot recommend it enough. Okay, and Engineers SG, so we've got the guy filming tonight. Um, it will be cut down into a few different sections and thrown on our website. Thank you very much. But, on to the topic. Okay, so, my mum called me the other week and she went, Elizabeth, you've put the word online. <laughs> 
I was like, yes, mum. It's, it's okay. It's called Triple F. It's fabulous female fuck-ups. She's like, oh, don't say it out loud. Okay, sorry. My traditional English mother is slightly in awe of this situation. There was an article that came out in The Guardian just this week where Dame Judy Dench was... Um, basically shown in a positive light because older women are starting to swear more and it's because they're taking back their power. <laughs> I don't know, don't know if we need to go that far, but there's actually something wonderful about people being able to speak in public about the things that have gone wrong. Now this is on a large scale, whether it's entrepreneurs losing companies and thousands of dollars, or if it's on a personal level of was I brave enough, did I step up and do the thing I should have done? Um, the funny one that happened this week is we popped Cindy Gallup in our, in our mention and she actually shared our, our topic online, our event online, because she was so excited about the triple F. I'm going to try and avoid saying fuck up all night because my mum will be watching the video. <laughs> um, it is a really fascinating one how that connotation has changed and how people are embracing it now. So, without further ado, we've got f four awesome speakers tonight. We only publicly said that there was three, but we've got an extra one. So, without further ado, can you please join me on stage? Come on, Wendy. Come on, Regan. Come on, Douglas. So, we could be... We could be funny and try and introduce them and say lots of uh, funny stories about them because I know them all pretty well. Um, however, what we're going to do is we're going to see how good their pitch is. So they've, they've literally got a minute to tell us all the amazing things about themselves. Um, because I hate it when people do speeches and they start this person, pass the mic down, I'm going to start here. And you can choose left or right. <laughs> Left or right for what? Oh, we always pass it. Oh, okay, hi. Uh, hi, I'm Wendy. I work at Oracle. I also curate Lady Badassery in APAC. I'm the mother of two. I've lived in Singapore for seven years, and I love Lizzie dearly. <laughs> I knew you'd go to me. Hi, everyone. I'm Regan Bailey. Um, my core role is um, MD for Zaxis in Singapore. I also do some other stuff, um, so I take on the... Uh, talent strategy and diversity for APAC um, and I also I'm a member a happy member of um, the IAB board um, I yeah I knew I knew you were here I knew I had to say that um, and I've been here for about four years um, I came over with my husband and my five-year-old son um, we can never go back because I love the weather so much um, and so that's me Hi, my name is B. Silent. I manage the Singapore branch of JARS Publications, which is a corporate communications company. I've been in Singapore for seven years as well, and uh, very happy here. I've got a toddler and a soon-to-be newborn, and uh, that's about it, really. I'll pass it back. Um, I have a Wikipedia page, um, and I have a three-month-old baby girl. Um, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about. Uh, please download my app, Vanity, uh, and, and find me for a fifteen dollar discount later. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Before I let you talk about social, because Douglas did such a rubbish job at introducing himself, he has literally been named as one of the millionaires that won or that created all and lost it all and then got it back again. Um, he's an incredible superstar and you'll learn lots more about him over this uh, over the course of this panel. Um, he taught me something tonight which was uh, a lovely Chinese proverb that literally says um, somebody else to somebody else's trumpet is louder your than yours. Yeah. About blowing your own trumpet. Exactly. Yeah. Okay you tell them about social. So we are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So you can find us um, Twitter at she says sg, and on Instagram at she says dot Singapore. So tweet, share, tag your photos, and let us know. Show us what you what you learned today. Um, ask us your questions, and we may also take questions from the floor and from social media by the end of the event. Um, yes. So we shall kick off with our first question for today. So for our panel, what is your biggest fuck up and how did it come about? And what did you learn from it? Uh, I made my first million when I was 23. Uh, I lost it about one and a half years after that. 
So uh, I spent so so by at that, at that time I've already sold like three companies. So at that time uh, it was like 2005 ish six. So um, I did nothing, party all the time. Um, <laughs> yeah, just just had a lot of fun. Um, oh, I sold three companies. Um, yeah, my first one was a whole. Uh, no, I made three point something million. Yeah, almost four, four plus mil. Um, so my first business was a hosting company, and my second business uh, was like an online forum, and then my third one was like a website design development um, hardware trading company, and then uh, yeah, so I sold all all three of that. Um, so the, the biggest fucked up there was. So, so when, when you party a lot, right, and you have no one else to party with, right, you end up partying with like brokers, traders, and basically people who, who party all the time, right? So um, I, got, I, got, I got interested in this very um, interesting movement in buying stocks and shares called the big brother, the big boys. So it, it those in the finance industry will understand. Um, so basically, you know, you just follow the herd, and then you, you pack some money, and then you, you, you earn some stuff. So um, I, I, I earned a million in nine months, and I lost it um, in... August 2007, yeah. So I lost everything. I had to sell my house. I was staying at, a, at the top floor of, um, uh, it's behind CK Tank at Orchard Road. Um, I had to sell my Porsche Boxster. I had to sell, um, yeah, pretty much everything. So I was penniless and um, I, had, I had a few job offers because they didn't know that I was penniless. So, um, yeah, because I mean, you're just very free and you just sold three companies. So you kind of get a list of offers right along the way. So. Um, I ended up borrowing seven thousand dollars from my mum, and I, and and you can read the article online. So anyway, I went to Indonesia, and then I spent a whole year, um, in a in a very shitty studio apartment, that I swore I'll never ever be poor again. So in that in that studio apartment, um, it was cold water. It was a very tiny apartment, about maybe hundred ish square feet. So it's literally just you go in, it's a toilet. Uh, it's, a, it's very disgusting. It's about 25 year old, never renovated since then. Tons of cockroaches, insects and whatever. So yeah, I bathe in cold water every single day. And then after that, um, I can only eat two food a day because I only got $7,000. So I can only eat like, um, the downstairs my, my house was um, the nasi goreng guy, which is like fried rice, and then the fried me, noodle. And then, um, yeah, so there's the only two food I can eat every day for a year. Um, so then I um, managed to launch the website, but that's not enough. So at the time I launched this website called Show Nearby to find the nearest thing uh, nearby. And that didn't work. In 2008, Lehman Brothers closed down. All the advertisers that I was talking to that wanted to advertise with us, the whole marketing team was gone. Right? So I, I don't know if any of you gone through that, but basically literally every, every company cut their corporate budget. There's no advertising. You know? so, so here I am with a website. There's quite a decent number of traffic, which means I have to pay a lot of server costs as well, and no revenue. So then I went under again, and I went, started fixing computers for people, and then designing their websites for them, go to retail stores. Um, I mean, of course, I have a small team of three people doing that together with me. Um, we're left with like 100K left in the bank, because um, in between halfway, we managed to get an angel investor who parked um, about 250K with us. And then after that, um, since the website didn't work, um, Thankfully, a lot of people want us to fix their computers for them and build their websites for them. So that kind of work. And uh, by 2008, uh, we were making about 700 over $1,000 in net profit just by designing website and developing website for people. Uh, thankfully, because the Singapore government has this PIC, SIP back then, so they, they literally like pay you $2,000 to build your website. So that was a very good business for us. My sweatshop is in Indonesia. So um, back then, the, the engineers were like 100, 200 a month. Of course, now it's much, much different. But back then, it's 100, 200 a month. You know? So yeah, so, so I, I did all of that to make sure that we can get by. And then I reinvested all the money again into building a show nearby mobile app. So in 2009, January, when Android um, was really, really new, and it was the very first, like I think it was what, uh, G1, it's, it's the first Android phone in the world. So I said, okay, la, Google won't fail. La. iOS has so many competitors building something nearby, car park nearby, restaurant nearby, bus stop nearby. Okay, I'll just do Android and Android only. So uh, we launched the show nearby Android version in January, and then in less than three months, we, we, we became number one because there's no other apps that's competing with us. Um, and then 
suddenly every handset manufacturer, Sony, LG, Motorola, um, HTC, anyone you can think of that was developing an Android handset basically found us and said, hey, I want to, to preload your, your, your application on our phone. So then it started with, oh, okay, cool, you're preloading me and advertising me for free. Then it went on to, huh, maybe you should pay me to load my app into your phone. You know, so, so it went on like that. And then in nine months, uh, Yellow Pages bought our company. Yeah, so that's I roughly. I think you just triple F my brain. That was like a hell of a journey. So what we saw. Maybe at 2009. Still eight more years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's amazing. So no, hold on, I'm just digesting. Okay, so okay, just a small recap. There was like the time when you built these companies and then they all you were partying too hard and that was one fuck up. And then you moved to Indonesia and cold showers and they were really fucked up. <laughs> and then from that you built a team of experts that created computers and fixed them. And then you got better because it went into Android. Okay, now I'm, okay, I'm up to date. Carry on. That's all right. No, no, keep going, keep going. So we've been just starting. We still have like wow. eight years to cover. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I will, I will fast forward because you can Google most of that information. Uh, so after I sold nearby, then I so the reason why I sold nearby was because we couldn't make money. The application had a lot of users. We had a million, over a million downloads. We have one hundred twenty thousand users using us every day, which is in today's standards still very big. Um, and we have like 10 million dollars in India. We partnered with uh, Met My India in India, and uh, but we couldn't make money, so it was very sad. So I sold to Yellow Pages, and then after that, uh, when I finished the contract, so I, I decided my next business must make money. So I built um, Vanity Trove, which is a beauty box um, business in Southeast Asia. So uh, in 18 months, we grew to seven countries, um, and so we were very aggressive. I was only in Singapore maybe three to five days, flying every other day. We grew to like 80 people, and we have about six million dollars in uh, revenue run rate, um, 22,000 subscribers across seven countries. And we decided to pivot. So then I had a hard time telling my investors, I'm going to kill the business and I'm going to change the business entirely to services. So um, because beauty product sales is very difficult. Uh, E-commerce sales for beauty products in your minds, um, there's a certain fixed price and you expect a discount if it's online somehow. Um, and then you expect free delivery plus we must market to you. So the beauty products very hard to make money and the average spend of a beauty product is like 35 to 50 bucks per order so it's very difficult to make money. So then um, when during the whole process of trying to help the beauty industry, I got attracted to how a lot of these um, beauty makeup artists, um, hairdressers, uh, beauticians, um, they're really passionate in what they do. They really, really love what they do. And it's, 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 it's somewhat interesting that they they, they, they don't have um, degree, MBA, PhDs, they have none of that. But uh, they, they really love helping their customers look prettier. Whether is it um, solving their acne problem or whether is it like making them prettier with like maybe some contouring makeup or something, you know? Um, but basically in their respective job, that's, that, that's, that's what they want to do. And uh, because of that, being artisans, right? So what does it mean? It means that they don't really know how to charge. So they're usually... They, they usually go very low on prices. So then you have the bigger brands, the bigger salons, the bigger chains that will come in and say, oh, you know, um, this is the price. So then all the staff will be like, you know, just try and do their best. And then the boss say, hey, if you want a commission, you got to sell this, you know. And then she's pressured, right? So then we thought, okay, uh, we're going to start Vanity. We're going to help um, these women who, who are currently providing these um, services so passionately to their customers, making them happy, a platform so that they can um, charge fairly. And, and consumers um, don't have to um, make, find, find it so hard to find them because when you're getting married, the first question you, ha you have is like, who's going to be my makeup artist? So you're going to ask all your friends who's going to be a makeup artist and all your friends are going to recommend you a thousand and one makeup artist and you're still wondering who's the best one for you. So uh, on Vanity, we have all of that. You can see their portfolio. You can chat with them. You can um, do all those, all those stuff uh, just to assure you and be confident in your booking. So we started off doing like all the home-based um, artists, so home-based and freelancers in the beginning. Uh, then, of course, two years later, Oh, okay, so my seed round was five million. Okay, uh, yo, don't raise, yo, no startups here. Okay, anyway, never mind. Yeah, so my, my seed round is five million, and then uh, so we 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 focus a lot on the um, beauty professionals, the beauty freelancers, but um, unfortunately they don't make much money because they don't charge so much either. Uh, but thankfully, some of them started to open up shops. 
So um, that gave me a very good transition to say, okay, now we also support salons and shops um, who don't mind having transparent reviews, genuine feedback from consumers. So um, a review can only be made on vanity if you have made a real purchase. A real booking. So, so we now have like thousands of reviews and 98% of all our bookings have ratings above 4 star and our reviews, 66% of our reviews have pictures and a lot of text. It's not your normal, good, I'm satisfied. It's really chunks of text from fellow um, women in the community who really love the service and they share it. Yeah, so that's... Okay, I'm going to come back and ask you more about the fuck up team capability. However, I think a range of these things can happen. So incredibly successful has gone from the highs to the lows. What are all those like little things in between? Where are the points that you kind of um, have a bit of a fuck up kind of on a smaller scale, I would say? Um, Regan, you work at an incredibly successful place now. Have you had any kind of um, places where you've gone wrong before getting there? Um, yeah. Have I got to follow that? <laughs> I can't, I can't follow that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank thank you. Um, well, actually, it kind of, I've actually had a, a failed business myself, so it kind of reminds me about that, but very, very different. And mine will be a very different story, and there was certainly not that kind of money floating around. Um, but when I was 22, I actually left a very well-paid um, job with equity because I thought that I could run my own business. I don't know what that was based on. Um, but I started my own agency with two partners, and it was kind of like a reverse MBA, like everything, if that teaches you how to run a business, we did everything wrong, like how not to run a business. I should write a book about that. So everything that could go wrong went wrong, starting with, you know, my partners who were 10 years old and they had MBAs. I thought they'd know how to run a business. They didn't. Um, we didn't know how to run a P&L. We didn't really understand how cash flow works. We didn't understand that accountants pay for themselves when we were getting massively fined because we were trying to do our own books. Um, it was just one thing after another, and it was, it was absolutely amazing experience. But the same, uh, you know, the same thing. I actually it sort of culminated in a, a huge, spectacular fail at the end, where it went into liquidation after two and a half years, and I was kind of left broke, um, you know, uh, homeless because I couldn't afford my flat anymore. Um, I also lived in a really shitty studio flat for a, a quite a while. I had to sleep with a knife under my pillow because it was so bad. Um, and yeah, yeah, exactly. You don't have them in Singapore. Um, and you know, it was just, it was just a very, very hard time. Um, the car had to go back and all of that kind of stuff. So I didn't have transport and I kind of had to pick myself up off the floor and, and start again and say, right, what now? How do I do this? But when I was thinking back, and this is quite a, a long time ago, that wasn't the fuck up. Um, the fuck up was actually the fact that I didn't tell anyone. Um, I didn't confide in my friends. I didn't talk to my parents. Um, I just, I was kind of ashamed. Um, and I kind of took it all on myself to try and get back and get back on my feet. And, you know, on paper, what a great story. Yeah, I got back and I got a job and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But it probably stayed with me for quite a few years and actually kind of um, affected my confidence for quite a few years and it was just something I carried with me um, and now I look back and think why didn't I go out and have martinis with my friends and you know laugh till I cry or cry till I laugh or whatever um, and also because I didn't process what had happened I actually made a few of those mistakes again because I didn't kind of work through what had gone wrong so you know we all kind of mess up from time to time but um, that's just life, and I, I probably wouldn't change it because I learned so much from it. But, you know, I would definitely, and I've got some of my best friends here, you know, when I, they know when I do fuck up, we go out and we get drunk and we have a laugh about it. And, you know, they help me get through it, and I think you, you really, you really, really need to do that. Awesome. Does that answer the question? Yeah, very good. Um, Wendy, can you follow that with something that you've done that's fucked up, whether you've cried about it or whether you've dropped martinis? Oh, um, probably done a bit of both. Uh, I think, you know, there's definitely a lot of professional, you know, launching websites or products and things that failed and investing in things and thinking that people know how to run a business just because of their job title and realising actually a lot of people don't know how to run a business. Um, but I think for me on a more personal level, um, I was put into a management role before I was 30 
and uh, it took me a long time to grow into uh, what I was actually supposed to be doing and, and, and I think I did a lot of fucking up uh, along the way and you know this was the early internet years so um, that was around 2001 that I was put into a management role and I had a team of about a hundred and something people uh, at one stage and you know I wasn't much older than anyone else and learning how to manage as well as uh, run a business and understand P&Ls and why you actually need a HR manager and all that process shit um, <laughs> you know um, uh, and you know learning how to fire people as well as hire, you know how to hire great people and how to fire people and fire people fast um, because you know how much of an impact toxic people have on your culture how much of an impact um, not hiring the right people has on your ability to do to deliver a great business and a great outcome for the business all of those things you learn as you become a manager uh, and and trying to help grow the grow the business and grow the people that work for you and i think my biggest mistake or fuck up was really that uh, I had imposter syndrome, you know, but being promoted so young and, and never really having had management experience and making it all up as we went along. Um, so I never thought big enough and that meant that I didn't uh, take my team with me as, as far as we probably could have gone, you know, like um, if you're not really promoting yourself and driving and, and celebrating your own success, then you're not celebrating the, the success of your team as well and, and you're creating a fake ceiling for everyone that works for you. And um, so I kind of regret that in some ways and, and I learned a lot from that in terms of my own confidence and my own ability and, and also as a manager, your responsibility is, you know, your team is what makes you successful and making your team successful and celebrating your team means celebrating yourself as well. What, what, uh, I have a question. How did you talk yourself out of the imposter syndrome and what advice would you give to girls, young girls or young ladies who have that now because it's really common and we don't really talk about it that much. Great question. Uh, I actually formed a network of um, a, lo a lot of ladies in this room actually uh, and, and a lot of other ladies. So I, um, every couple of months we have dinner and, uh, and I have someone speak at that dinner and, and, and usually on a topic that I want to learn about, I'm pretty selfish about it, I curate who I want to have there. Um, <laughs> I curate the content and the attendees and the venue and, um, and hope that everyone else wants to learn what I want to learn. And, um, and through doing that, I've really been able to to understand that everyone's, everyone's, you know, we're all going through the same shit. Yeah. Um, we all have the same fears and insecurities. Uh, we all don't think we're as, as good as other people think we are. Uh, all that kind of stuff. So I really have been conscious about creating uh, interactions with people that I can learn from. Mm -hmm. And also through, actually like when I was on the IAB board and a couple of other boards where I was the only woman I started to get to know people that I thought extern you know, I externally always thought of them as some kind of gods or whatever. And the more time I spent with them in this third party environment, the more I realized that they didn't really know any more than I did. Right. And um, in fact, a lot of them knew a lot less than I did. Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, you know, getting involved in third party things like being on the IAB or being, on, being involved in running an event like this, you really get to interact with a lot of cross section of the industry. Um, and that was another thing I fucked up. Like I, I spent 14 years with the same company and for 13 of them, I never interviewed anywhere else. I never ever, like I was so absorbed in what I was doing and building my team and building the business that I just, you've got to be external as much as internal and you've got to cultivate networks across way beyond your own industry as well. Um, so I found that really empowering, is, you know, building a, a, a professional learning environment um, of, with people that I trust and people I can learn from. Amazing. Thank you. I think um, on, on, on that same note, I think there's a lot to be said for um, mentorship programs, and I don't know if you guys have ever sort of done that or looked into it, both from the mentor perspective and the mentee perspective, and just it's a great way, I think, to avoid this, especially for, for younger people who, you know, you might see that they're, they're going through the sim a similar s stuff yeah. that you went through maybe 10 years ago, and you can probably save somewhat a lot of that sort of uh, 
a lot of fuck ups along the way. So I think, yeah, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start looking for one after my mat leave. But um, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, it's something that I think we need to push a lot more within our networks. And I, and I also agree that there's a lot to be said for having a network outside your company, outside your business, outside your industry. Because um, there's so much we can learn from each other, even if it's not even related. Um, and especially in terms of running a business and stuff like that. And, and yeah, that not everyone knows actually what they're doing and a lot of people are faking it till they make it and some of them just fake it better than others until you start talking to them and you realize, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> and you realize just on that note, I think, it's, I think it's a really important one. Um, so she says globally have something called Who's Your Mama? And it is a mentoring piece where you get paired up with different people. Now we haven't started that in Singapore. Um, we weren't sure how to do it and we wanted to make sure we did it in the right way. Um, it can be a really challenging one to try and find a mentor. I find it's very personal and it's a real connection that you need to make with that person. So we don't actually provide that service, but I do tell everybody that comes to She Says, go and be your mentor. You can find your own mentor as well, but go and mentor somebody else you need it. Because actually everybody in this room has something to offer, something to teach somebody else. So actually, the best way that we can start a mentoring system is by making you all mentors, because then at least the younger generation have got that. I'm going to quickly throw it back to B because she's not spoken enough about herself. Um, I actually persuaded her to come onto this panel tonight. I technically fucked up by inviting everybody to the panel very late, only a couple of days or weeks before it happened. We're normally a lot more kind of courteous than that. So B had a really big thing that she wanted to talk to about tonight. Um, she actually felt her driving test three times. <laughs> I'm not going to point a finger at that though. Um, it was more about, as an editor, I'm intrigued by the voice that people give to you and how you edit around that. So if somebody comes to you with a piece that has got a lot of mistakes in or a way that they're trying to express something, how do you correct somebody by kind of making, taking out the, the fuck ups or do you kind of leave them in or do you dance around them? I think there's a, there's a lot of aspects to that. So, so one of the one of the services we provide is is proofreading. Um, so, in terms of the clients, I would say you definitely have to be very tactful because people people get very attached to their writing. Even even as a copywriter, you know, you, you get very attached to the stuff that you've, you've created. It's very personal, and um, and as an editor or a proofreader, you can push back to a certain degree. And you know, you can definitely correct the grammar, correct the typos, stuff that you can you know, really prove, look, it is definitely wrong. But stylistically or t um, speaking about tone and stuff, there is a lot of stuff that is personal. And in terms of clients, definitely at the end of the day, the client's always right. And, you know, quite often you just have to bite your tongue and say, all right, well, you take it from here. You know, there's, there's only so far you can go. You don't want to push someone too far. In terms of um, internally proofreading, proofreading a colleague's stuff, I think it's very important to be self-aware. And yes, of course, you want to correct the grammar again and the typos, but it's very important to be aware that your style might not necessarily be their style. So I, in, in my previous company, in my previous role, there was, a, there was a, one of my colleagues would always proofread my stuff and she would change it to how she would say it, which, you know, there were definitely typos and stuff in there as well, but a lot of it was just changing it to her tone, her style, which wasn't necessarily my tone and my style, and it wasn't, and it, you know, it wasn't incorrect or correct, it was just different. And so I definitely learned a lot from that experience and I try very hard not to do that with other people's work, you know, if it's, if it's a colleague's work, to just try and respect that person's personal style. And, you know, that's the reason why they're a copywriter, because we believe in what they do. And, you know, if you just try and turn everyone into the same voice, you, you lose a lot of the company's personality, especially given that, you know, as, as a corporate comms company, we're working with multiple clients who all have different voices. So to make, you know, every company in Singapore sound like me would just be, I mean, it would be my dream, but it would be really weird. <laughs> so what I'm going to interpret from that is like, own your fuck up. Just say it how it is, be your own voice. You can correct me on that later. Um, Alicia, do you want to ask the next question? Where are you going to jump from here? So we're going to talk about damage control. Once you've had a fuck up, how do you damage control? How do you get over it? What do you, do you have any strategies? Do you have like a... Uh, 
<laughs> too late, too late by then. Well, as I say, I don't think, I think I, I did the damage control pretty well. It was kind of, I, I just didn't, um, yeah, I just spent the next three years driving myself into the ground with regrets. Um, but in terms of damage control, oh, thank you. Oh, that's mine actually done. Oh, okay, we'll have it afterwards. <laughs> um, and, um, thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, so basically, but, but I ended up writing what, you know, a list of what I could control and what I couldn't. And there wasn't much on what I couldn't control. And so I just kind of started to break it all down and say, what do I need first? And this was absolutely years ago. So you, you actually had to have an address first because we weren't emailing so much. So it was like, I need to have an address. So I kind of scraped together some money. I think in the UK, they would just lend you anything at the time to manage to get some money and got this studio flat. And then I, I kind of thought, I need money straight away. So, so what do I do? How do I get it quickly? Again, it was really time consuming to find a job then. So I phoned up an old boss and said, look, you know, I'm available. Can I come and do some consultancy? And that actually turned into my first job in platforms, which kind of turned into what my career is now. So it kind of, it, you know, it sort of, it worked out. But it was, a, it, it was a proper well thought out strategy of how the hell do I get out of this? And it was a really driven by self-preservation and still that horrible ego pride thing of I mustn't lose face here. And, you know, I, I don't think that's necessarily a, a, a good thing. And um, as I say, looking back, I, on paper, I did the right things, but I, I, I challenge whether I did now and I should have just gone off and spent a year in Bali. <laughs> That, yeah, I, yeah. I didn't answer that question. No, 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 no. <laughs> Douglas, how did you um, damage control? Uh, okay, so with only $7,000, you can't do anything much in Singapore, even in 2007. Um, yeah, so going to Indonesia, um, I kind of figured that the engineer would cost about 100 200 a month. Um, so, and, and since I rented the apartment, so that's my office as well. So they, they come to work there. It's about two hours away from Jakarta. So um, that's my first damage control. Second damage control. Uh, must I go through all? PR kind of perspective. PR. Like, yeah, like, did you sort of tell everybody in the world that the company had gone under and that you'd party the life away? Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I was very honest, actually. Right. Yeah, so, so I, I, I was so honest that uh, my initial investors didn't want to invest in us because I was like, yeah, I lost all my money in the stock market. They're like, oh, oh, I'm not going to invest in you. <laughs> then, then, then I got 7K for my mom into Indonesia and then tried to find the next investor. And then this time I was like thinking, should I tell her? Should I not tell her? Okay, I thought I'll just be honest and tell her anyway. And then um, she was in construction and then she, she ended up investing. Um, and PR, yeah, so, so there was this like news article and there was an NUS case study on like the guy who, who, who built Shonia Bai, um, spectacularly failed, and then now fixing computers for people. Yeah, so there was, yeah, you can Google that online. Um, yeah, so there was an article on that where the headline was something like, um, what ah? Uh? Tech companies, uh, it, was, it was that period where a lot of tech companies couldn't raise money and then it was like, you know, tech companies couldn't raise money or something. And then it was like, put, it, put in bold in a big statement down there that says, I'm going to fix computer even if, I, even if I have to or something. Yeah. Oh my God. Do you, oh, but, um, do you use the media to help correct? Uh, no, I mean, it's true. So then a week later after that, Microsoft contacted us. And they said they want to help us. So we're like, okay, give me free office, free everything, anything you can give me for free, just give it to me. <laughs> yeah, so, so during, during that phase, uh, I think uh, Sean Bell was quite lucky. We got a lot, a lot of press coverages during that period because uh, I was just being very honest to the, to the media and I think the journalists kind of like that. Um, yeah, but sometimes they get cheeky with the way they draft the sentences. So you yeah. just kept yeah. moving forward. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, to, to make it exaggerated. <laughs> Don't you think the narrative has moved on now? And you know, that whole idea around failing and learning, uh, or flirn as someone coined it some years ago. Um, and, and you know, all the tech entrepreneurs now have at least one failure behind them. So it's more acceptable to fail and pick up and start again. So you're like the poster child for it. Yeah, it's a badge of honor, right? And you're the poster child for the Singaporean version. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, you can say I've done it and I did it again. Uh, luckily, you've got the good outcome that you actually ended up making money. So just on that note, if it is a badge of honour, so I've had three failed startups 
Is it different to the industry? Is it different in big corporates? So would Oracle hire me had they known that I got fired uh, from my previous job? Uh, if we're on video, I'd rather not. Um, <laughs> would, would a corporation <laughs> hire you? Um, that, that's a tough cast. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> big, big industry, uh, I think different enterprises look at it differently. And I think more modern, digitally native enterprises are much more likely to hire you based on the variety of your experience and how you've adapted. You know, because we live in a very rapidly changing world and being adaptable and being able to pivot and do things differently as a result of learning about things that aren't working is a very valuable skill and something that everyone should celebrate. But there's a few legacy companies that are still getting their head around how to uh, integrate that into their business and how to celebrate that and um, adapt their business model to champion um, the ability for people to do that internally. So their HR uh, functions may not yet appreciate how to celebrate someone that may have that kind of experience generally speaking, in my observation. <laughs> Great idea. Um, just, just kind of looking at that kind of that larger world um, in industry, and I'm kind of pointing at the two of you because you've seen sort of bigger corporations. How, we've seen a lot of press around CEOs kind of getting it wrong and either apologizing it or really not United you know, Airlines. Between you. Um, there, there's a few people that will apologize publicly and there's a few that won't. Where do we stand in that world of soft skills for CEOs? By the way, I only <laughs> gave them three questions which were, <laughs> have you ever fucked up? How did you ever control? They're my piece now. <laughs> That's a little bit. Um, I, I'm really passionate about the role of the CEO, uh, particularly in legacy businesses and um, it, working in transformation and, and thinking about how businesses need to change their models, it all starts with the CEO. And if the CEO doesn't get it, then the business isn't going to change. Um, and do I see CEOs taking responsibility and ownership of, of what they need to do differently? Uh, no. So I think um, there's a lot of people with their heads buried in the sand, hoping it'll all just go away. And I think those type of people, again, are less likely to be publicly taking ownership of mistakes. Um, and <clears throat> I think, it, you know, in a, in a customer-driven world, that empathy that you get from someone admitting that they've done something wrong and trying to fix it and address it in a really fast and effective way, um, you, you earn more brownie points and you earn more loyalty than you do from just pretending it didn't happen or writing it off to that's not the way we do things in this corporation. So. You can, you can actually turn an event like that into your, into, to your advantage. You know, there's so many great examples, especially in the UK, of, of companies, you know, that have had massive problems and but they've actually turned it around because they've been able to react in a timely and, you know, if appropriate, hu humorous manner, you know, a lot of times bringing, bringing humor into it and, uh, or just showing a bit of personality can go such a long way to repairing the damage and even, it can even go further. It can take your brand a lot further than it was before in a positive way, mm. I would say. Yeah. I was just going to say, I think it's um, sort of something that's relevant to everyone as well. I think sometimes, you know, if, if we make mistakes, just a genuine heartfelt apology and actually taking responsibility for what you've done um, is, can, be, can go a long way and also can be very disarming. Um, and also having worked in corporate comms as well, I know that CEOs, even when they're told what to say, don't listen and do the other thing. So, so just on that note, um, I had an overseas visitor come over to the IPG family um, and in a forum like this, obviously it was closed door, um, and I can't repeat anything that was said, but it was a hilarious moment where I kind of asked about the gender diversity that should be in creative teams. And sometimes if you don't have a succinct answer, it's better to go, hey, let me get back to you. Because after 
three, mm, well, no, I'd go 15 minutes of going around in circles and sinking himself into a small hole, we kind of said, it's all right, you can leave the question. <laughs> um, so these guys have actually done an incredible job of answering the questions quite succinctly um, and making sure that we're kind of all aware of the, the point they're getting to. Um, we've got a couple more questions, but then the emphasis is on you guys. So have you guys got some questions that you'd like to ask these awesome people? It can be anything to do with um, effing up, um, or it could just be something that you've read about them. I, uh, in my bit of research, I did notice that Regan um, put a little video together on YouTube about Christmas wishes. So I'll, I'll, get, I'll get around to that one. <laughs> um, Alicia, have you got another question for the panel? Yep. Uh, so when do you decide it's time to throw in the towel when you're working on a project or you're working on your startup or your business and you realize that you're fucking up? When do you throw in the towel? Um, I'd like to say it's when you're unhappy um, and, and not enjoying something, but I actually think that's often the worst time to leave something because I think you, you can make really bad choices. Um, for me, and when it's happened in the past, was a situation where I was unhappy, but it got to the stage where um, I was losing my confidence. Because I think if you're, if, and I kind of talk to this, I've got some of my team here, I talk to people about this all the time and protecting your confidence. Because, um, you know, it, nothing's worth losing your confidence over. And it can, you can lose it in a second and it can take years to get back. Um, so for me, it got to the stage with this particular job. And, you know, you're your own worst enemy sometimes, trying to make something work when it's clearly not right. Um, and it wasn't working for me. And finally, after far too long, um, you know, this time I did confide in somebody, and she actually sorted me out with this amazing coach and, uh, who was an award-winning actress in the UK, and she was absolutely phenomenal. And she came to talk to me, and she took one look at me and said, oh, dear, we've got some work to do. Because... Um, <laughs> I was like introverted, like sort of, oh. um, and, uh, and she, she really made me realize that what the hell was I doing? I needed to kind of get out of there and, and find my voice again. Um, so for me, it was like, that was the towel drop. I think from a business perspective, it's a commercial decision, right? And you, if, if you can clearly, when you're doing a forecast and you're looking at the business plan and the, like the next 12 months and, if it's costing more than um, it's making, then um, you need to, you know, you need to make the call, and you either need to reduce the expenses um, and or change the model for the revenue model. Or if either neither of those are going to work, then you just got to make a call and move on. So you know, it's pretty easy when the numbers, you know, the numbers speak for themselves. Would you agree? Yeah. <laughs> um, so so for Vanity Trove, when we had that six million, right? Um, it was, a, it, it was, believe me, it's very difficult to convince your investor that you're not going to sell the company, you're not going to continue the company, and you're just going to bring it down to zero and pivot. Yeah, so most investors will be like, um, why don't we try and sell it to someone else? But then the investor is not thinking for me. I'll have to work that, for that someone for at least the next one to two years to three years, depending on who's the buyer and how much they're paying for. So, um, yeah, so, so I guess at, at that point, the, the, the first tower was like um, deciding whether or not to, to pivot. Like, should I continue selling beauty products online or should I pivot to beauty services? So that was the first. Um, the numbers just didn't make sense as I, as I described to you guys earlier for beauty. Um, we will just end up burning a lot of money. But believe me, even after you show to the investors that you'll just burn a lot of money, they will still be like, but we have six million in revenues. You know, maybe we can consider selling it to someone else. Yeah, so that was the first time. Then the second time was like, um, as I shared earlier, when, when we were... Uh, trying to cater to the, to the salons because um, a lot of the home base and freelance um, beauticians and artists that we were partnering with, um, we, we don't want them to feel betrayed. We don't want them to feel like, hey, you know, um, we, we started this platform for you guys. Um, we're trying to help you um, to, to reach out to consumers and then now we are helping a salon that can have walk-in crowd. So, um, so we were very, very careful in, in, in that transition phase. And um, we, we, were, we were really trying to address um, as much of their concerns as honestly as we can, as transparently as we can. So we told them the truth that we wouldn't be able to make money and we wouldn't be able to survive, nor will we be able to sustain if we um, continue this path. So we have to cater for salons and you. Um, so, so what we did was we created a ranking system for them. So then uh, they started to be happier and then the salons weren't that happy. Then we started to... Um, um, help the salons to like say, okay, now we're split. Okay, so there's shops, there's artists. So 
two, dif two different segments and so on. Um, hey, Douglas, I've got a random one for you. When did you lose your confidence on any of that journey? <laughs> So, so, so coaching is quite interesting. So last year I went found this coaching pause um, where a group of like um, startups that have raised at least a few million will gather together. So, um, so, so there, there, there was like this um, three, uh, one VC, one, uh, two coaches and one VC. So, so the whole session was about three days. And at that, at that moment was when, was when it was like, so what do you want to do in life? Whoa. <laughs> so I, 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 didn't, I didn't think of that because straight after um, you know, I sold Shonevai to Yellow Pages, I was like thinking, okay, maybe I'll just, um, um, you know, just straight away jump to something that I can make money from. So, so I did Vanity Trove. Uh, and the initial intent was actually just to build it in 18 months, seven countries like Groupon, then you know, just sell it off quickly. That was the initial intent. But as, 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 as we built that, we, we just fell in love with the business and, and we realized that there's just so much gap in the beauty industry. And, and, and interestingly, uh, most engineers are men, right? So they are unlikely to build beauty um, solutions. And uh, most women don't want to be engineers. So uh, not now more, but you know, two, three years ago, less. So most women don't want to be engineers, so there's not much engineers, so then there's not much solutions for beauty companies anyway. So, so, we, so, so that, that's why we think that it's a big um, opportunity. And um, we... So you lost your confidence when? <laughs> when I went to the Bali trip. <laughs> yeah, 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 that, that, that period. Yeah. Uh, three days, intense workshop, 8 a.m. 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. every night, every day. Yeah. That's that's definitely pushing on sleep deprivation. <laughs> they, were, they were drilling you into a place of like something. So so that, that that point was like you know, am I running the company correctly? Because um we we so in Vanity Trove we had like 80 people in seven countries. Then we went all the way down to four, right? And then after that, when we did Vanity, we also had this very nice hockey stick growth where we went all the way up to 35 people. Revenues were, were crazy, numbers were crazy, bookings were crazy, and so on. Then last year was winter for investments. So if you're familiar in the startup world, last year was very difficult to raise money. Um, so I had to do what you know normal guys would do, uh, normal CEOs would do, and I cut the team. Yeah. So so we went all the way down to I think about. 10, 10 people, yeah, from 35 to 10. Uh, we shifted from a bigger office to a much smaller one and so on and so forth. So then that period was also the same time where I went for the Bali uh, coaching thingy and then it was like, wow. <laughs> Thank you very much. And, I, and, and I, just, uh, I just got married in 2015 December, went for my honeymoon in May and then I was like, you know, in, in between thoughts of like, oh, am I doing the right thing? Should I have, should I have just sold Vanity Trove? <laughs> <laughs> So it takes a lot of bravery for these guys to stand up here and talk about failure in pieces like this. And obviously we're pushing them to do it. Now it's your turn to push them. Has anybody got a question that you'd like answered by the panel? Um, wonderful. Go Gabby, we'll throw a microphone at you with your softly spoken ways. <laughs> uh, just, just a question for Douglas. So how big's the team now? Um, now we have 12 full time, um, but at any one time we have about eight to 10 interns. How many yeah. of them are women? Uh, uh, hang on, hang on. Uh, 12 full time in Singapore, then I got um, three in Malaysia and two in Korea. Yeah, okay. How many of them are women? Um, so all the interns are women, definitely. There, there's no, 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 male, no male interns. You know, uh, um, about, but, but half the company are women, except the engineers. So 12 people, eight are engineers. So in the engineering team, six are men, two ladies. Come on, ladies, get into engineering. Yeah, get into engineering. Yeah. Programming. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yeah. uh, so this one's for everybody across the panel. Um, what would you say is the best or most sort of um, memorable piece of constructive feedback that you have received either professionally or personally? Hey. <laughs> Um, so this was advice I got from my from my previous boss, and um, and I don't think she meant it politely, but it's it's still very good advice, which was basically just own it. You know, I was in in my previous job, I, I hadn't been in the work for in a normal job for very long. I was a journalist in the UK. I did live su subtitling, neither of which are sort of corporate nine to five jobs. And when I moved to Singapore, I had my first sort of you know proper day job, and. Um, and I, I didn't even know how Outlook worked. I didn't really know anything apart from I used to use it in my old job for arranging parties. That was about it. And um, 
So I had a lot to learn and, and my confidence was, was very low in that new sort of corporate environment. And, um, and, and one of the things I did was, um, I, well, I didn't have enough confidence in the work that I was doing and, and she would always say, you know, you need to own it. You need to own the project, you need to own the work and you need to own what you're doing. And, um, and, and again, I, I don't think she meant it in a polite way, but it's, uh, but it's very useful advice. And, and, and it comes back to what I was saying earlier, which is really, you know, fake it till you make it because eventually you will make it and then you can own it with, with confidence and hopefully then you're correct. Go <laughs> okay, after you. You got one? I think the fake it till you make it is a really good one. I've, I've heard it in different guises. I really, uh, 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 dressing up um, somebody being a complete nightmare, I heard as well, which was um, charisma works both ways. You know, someone with charisma can lift a room in an office. They can also cause everybody to feel the mood that they're feeling. Um, so I always thought that was a really good way to say, just calm down. <laughs> you know, just... Um, so, but fake it till you make it, I think, is, is a really, really good one. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to combine those two and really, like, throw everybody off slightly because I've had both of those pieces of feedback. Own it and don't take the room with you because, like, I'm literally the person that walks in and if I'm sad, like, everybody knows that I'm sad and if I'm happy, like, everybody gets a bit of it. 90% of the time I'm happy, it's great, but that 10% of the time, oh, you're in so much trouble. <laughs> I wasn't going to call myself charismatic. Um, but there's something interesting, right? Like, it was never given as positive feedback of you're so um, outgoing that people know it and feel it. You can change a room to happy to sad just because you're sad, you can't take everybody with you. And the interesting bit is own it, right? So, yes, that's who I am. I'm not going to run a company from a CEO position, so I'm not going to take a company down with me. I'm creative, I'm flamboyant. I'm wearing matchsticks to set the world on fire. Like, <laughs> nobody's going to give me millions of dollars, sorry, because <laughs> I'll spend it. <laughs> but there's something really lovely about owning it. Like, understand where your boundaries are, and then just go, okay, cool, I got this bit of it. And like, there's something quite charming about that. I knew you would. Why wouldn't you run a company? That's bullshit. You run about 50 different things. Why wouldn't you run a company? That's absolute bullshit. And you're not, like, really realizing your own potential, right? Agree. Who agrees with me? Agree. Like, I just don't think you're owning your boundaries at all, right? You're limiting yourself deliberately, and that's bullshit. From CFOs taking over to CMOs taking over now. So when do the creative directors take over? <laughs> There's no way you're not going to run your own business and be a CEO. There's just no way. And you're already doing it. You're already on your way there. So, you know. <laughs> Can you tell us the best bit of um, constructive feedback that you had? Douglas. Have, have you, has anybody given you feedback? From no. The same as the <laughs> yeah, the, the three days in Bali was like the most uh, useful, it helped me to see a lot of things because, you know, I've never worked for anyone in my life. So all the companies that I've worked in are all the companies that I sold to. So, um, I mean, other than when I was 14 and you work at some part-time jobs um, and I find those really stupid. Um, yeah, I've never worked for anyone in my life. So constructive feedback, those three days in Bali, uh, it was very... Uh, it, 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 it lent a different perspective because um, there, were, there were different people from different backgrounds. So some of them um, were entrepreneurs before this, some of them were like corporate jobs before this, some of them gave up their, their corporate jobs with huge equity, tens of millions of equity before this and so on and so forth. So everyone lent a different perspective and because we spent three intense days rotating around one another, um, it, it gave me a very different perspective. I'm like, oh, hmm. So I've done a lot of uh, not so good stuff in a HR perspective. <laughs> Do we, sorry, what did your mum say when you borrowed the 7,000 from? <laughs> ah, oh, yes. She must have had something. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so my mum said, okay, so, so this, this, this is the coolest part. Um, my mum said that whether I choose a job or I choose to do something on my own, she will fully support me. So when I asked her for 7,000, she was like, is this enough? And I was like, well, I don't know how much you have, how much can you give me? And then she was like, 
mm, yeah, I only have about 7,000. But then, but later on, she told me that, you know, if she, if she tell me she got more, then I, then I would probably want more. But she needed to pay for my bills and everything else that is needed to sustain the living, right? So she said she better to have some savings. Uh, so then when I, when I was flying to Indonesia, she sent me to the airport. Uh, so she always does that. Um, so she said that, what she said? She said something like, um, if anything happened, please just call um, family. So my mom's Indonesian, so I, I have an Indonesian family. Yeah, they're very well to do. So, <laughs> yeah, so, so they, she asked me to just call them if, if anything happens. <laughs> any other questions? <laughs> right, any other questions from the audience? Um, this is addressed to the panel. So, um, would, do any of you have any of you had any experience or any moments uh, or fuck ups? Um, that was a moment when you should have quit, but you didn't. And why didn't you? So before you answer that, who are you and uh, what do you do? What do I do? Yeah, come on, tell us all. Um, I'm, a, I'm Stephanie, uh, I'm a clinical psychologist. Awesome. Well, definitely not. Welcome. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. I, uh, I, I did a contract role not that long ago for a founder who um, was really passionate about his product and, and really, uh, uh, really believed in his ability to build his business. And I, um, I thought that I could help him. And actually, I realized pretty early on that he was going to be a very difficult person to help. Uh, and I should have walked much earlier than I did, but I had that typical female kind of, I, I can make a difference here, and, and I want to protect this team from this craziness, and I want to, um, you know, you know, give this a shot. And um, yeah, and I should have walked much earlier than I did. And in hindsight, I learned a lot. You know, I, w I wouldn't take back what I learned, mm -hmm. and made some great connections. But yeah, from a principal's perspective, I should have walked away from the business much earlier. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Vicky from She Says. Okay. <laughs> I work with Regan. <laughs> um, so Regan, you mentioned about how, like, um, you know, when, when, when you like, like when, when you were experiencing, <laughs> like in our private sessions. <laughs> um, no, but you mentioned about how, like, you know, when looking back, like, um, you know, in your past and how, you know, you wish that actually you could have talked to someone and stuff. How would you have done it differently? And I mean, just because I, I know a couple of people in my life who are going through a really difficult time who have been very successful and are now experiencing failures, um, kind of admitting failure and seeking out help, um, be it in the industry or in their own industry, is, is a very difficult thing. Not just in the fact that like, people don't want to be associated with you, but like, you know, also admitting it to yourself. So how, how would you handle something like that now? And I guess this would open to the rest of the panel too. Sure. Um, I think that, so now it's a lot different because I, um, I think just over time you, I mean, I talked before about ego and pride and they're, you know, um, they're, not, they're not necessarily things that I want to have in my life at this point. And, you know, it was really cathartic actually looking back on all the things that I've done wrong because I just really didn't care. You know, it was kind of funny, and I was thinking, oh, my God, I've done so many funny, you know, ridiculous things. Um, so I think if now it wouldn't affect me, and I would just deal with it in the way that I would... Um, it, it wouldn't affect me in the same way that it had. And I think that's something that you get with just experience and over time and all of those kind of things, getting old, all of that kind of stuff. Um, but I think... Um, then, looking back, if that's the question, what I could have done differently is it would have been to lose the pride and the ego and, um, you know, saving face and all that crap and, you know, who cares, really. And I could have confided, I could have asked for help, I could have just, um, you know, spoken to people about it that would have been happy to listen and give me great advice. Um, but also, I was so young, because I started work very young, I think it sort of ties in with building your network, building the people that you can trust, um, and I think you get that over time. So um, if, if that answers your question, I think maybe that's what I, I... I mean, I definitely would have asked for help and advice then, 
and I would have tapped into my network, whereas actually what I did is I pushed them away because I didn't want to, I, I didn't want to deal with it. But um, now, whatever, <laughs> yeah, I'd be fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I'd be fine. On that note, yeah. um, we're all sitting in a country that's actually really good at opening doors for each other. Um, having lived in the UK and Australia and a couple of other places, um, you can't always get access to the top people or to people above your level. Um, Singapore is very different about that. There's a really wonderful culture here that has been created of helping one another. Now, whether that's from a transient point of view or because we're all in it together, um, I would say reach out to people that, um, that you've got contact with, but even strangers and explain what's going on and how um, you'd like to learn from them. Uh, it's one of the things that I love about Singapore is that I can knock on the door of anybody, pretty much, and say, have you got half an hour for coffee? I'd love to talk to you about this topic or that topic. And the majority of people will come back to you and say, yes, of course. Um, I think it's a brilliant way for you to understand your skills, their skills, and how you can either work together or get better at what you do. So honestly, reach out to people. Um, I know a few people here have reached out to not just the she says girls that run this stuff, but also those that have been in these sort of communities. So please try that. Um, I'm actually going to wrap up tonight. It's been really wonderful hearing stories. Um, we're going to put on some loud music so you can all carry on your conversations and not everybody can overhear them. Because um, you'll probably get even better from conversations from these guys. Um, as it's been said tonight, network is kind of the strongest thing that you'll have. You'll want to lean on it a few times. Whether in the bad times, such as, oh, I'm kind of fucked up, I don't have a job, I did something wrong at work. Um, but also in the good times, um, make sure that you're giving back to those people that have either reached out to you or make sure you're, I think one of the really conversations was make sure you're um, looking after your team and your team isn't just at work. Make sure they get the praise they need, but your team is also um, the guys that she says. So, on that note, I'm going to quickly jump back to all the people that have gone tonight. <laughs> They're all in this room tonight, and I could not do any of this without them. So can I have a round of applause for them? <laughs> Go chat to them all. They're awesome. And finally, can I have a round of applause for the guys on the panel? social event will be in June. Um, come and get drunk with us. I mean, <laughs> come and talk to us if you uh, have any of your lovely pictures. Otherwise, I'm going to put some music on. Carry on. Thank you and good night.